Hey there friends. I am here to talk to you today about plot mapping and specifically addressing the different stages of Freytag's pyramid and how to apply that to a novel. Um, because we are all reading different novels for this particular project, I am actually going to follow Freytag's pyramid through Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Now, if you have not read this book yet, um, which I chose this because I figured um, most of you may have read the book or watched the movie at some point. If you haven't and you're worried about spoilers, well, I hate to tell you this, but this story is 23 years old. So <laughs> maybe you should get on that um, pretty quickly there. Fortunately, this is only the first book in the series and therefore it won't spoil too much for you just to tell you um, a little bit about it. Um, I chose this book because uh, not only is it well known, House on Mango Street was good for talking about theme, symbol, and motif, but um, it didn't really have much of a plot to follow. So that's why I, I tried to pick something else that had um, maybe a little bit more familiarity to most of you. Okay, so when you look at Freytag's Pyramid, this is what I'm talking about. And of course, feel free to take a screenshot of this so that you kind of have it by your side to review as you're working through your homework this week. But you can see it starts with the exposition, it moves on to the initial incident, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, the resolution, and then denouement is that fancy French word at the end there. And so what I'm going to do is take you through each of these stages um, with the story Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Exposition um, is the background information of the plot that includes characters and setting. Everything you need to know about um, the characters and their their histories are going to be revealed to you usually in the opening chapters or scenes if you're watching the movie. Um, the characters that we meet, the setting. So in Harry Potter, of course, one of the first people we meet is Harry Potter. Um, we also meet his family, the Dursleys, who are not very nice. And early in the story, we also meet his new friends, Ron and Hermione, and of course, all of the other, um, all of his uh, peers at Hogwarts and his teachers. Um, the very first place we see is Privet Drive where he lives with the Dursleys and then of course we also get to see Hogwarts which are the two main set settings of this particular story. The initial incident of any story is the very first conflict that occurs in the plot. This was kind of hard to determine um, with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, because he does seem to have quite a few conflicts with his relatives, the Dursleys. They are not very nice to him at all, and um, he seems to be getting in trouble constantly. However, um, while Harry has many obvious conflicts with them, uh, there is the incident that occurs at the zoo that incites the action uh, in this novel. Um, when they are at the zoo, Harry talks to a snake and accidentally magically causes the glass that separates a snake from people to disappear. Um, so not only, of course, does this get him in trouble again with the Dursleys, but it's also a little bit confusing and scary to him because he doesn't know how he made the glass disappear because he doesn't realize yet that he is a wizard or that magic exists. So um, I have chosen this as our initial incident for this particular example. The initial incident uh, sets off a series of incidents that are considered to be the rising action. Um, on the chart, a couple slides back, it talks about three major events that add suspense or tension to the plot and leads to the climax. Um, when you have a longer novel that's a little bit more complicated, you are going to have more um, events. You know, some They don't all add tension, but just to kind of like um, explain how one event builds on another, of course. I have looked at or listed several things that happen through the course of the novel of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So first of all, Harry gets invited to Hogwarts. Um, that causes tension because the Dursleys are not pleased that a bunch of owls are bringing letters to their house. And they try to escape and go off to this island in the middle of nowhere, but of course that's where Hagrid is able to find him. Um, he takes him to Diagon Alley, where they get all of his magic supplies, and also Hagrid picks up a mysterious item from Gringotts, which we find out later, of course, is the Sorcerer's Stone. 
Harry, over the course of this time, learns about he who shall not be named, Voldemort, who is his arch nemesis, arch nemesis, sorry. And, um, uh, you know, as Harry proceeds to go to the school, he meets Ron and Hermione on the train. He also meets Draco Malfoy, of course, who causes lots of tension throughout the story as well. Harry begins his schooling at Hogwarts, and he also makes allies and enemies among the staff. Uh, Harry and his friends learn of the Sorcerer's Stone hidden in a forbidden quarter on the third floor. Um, and as they're trying to find out more about that, they have ongoing adventures. Harry gets an invisibility cloak as a mystery gift for Christmas. He learns how to ride a broomstick and play Quidditch. Um, they have a bunch of run-ins with the Slytherins. Harry finds that mirror of Erised. Um, also, Harry and his friends um, notice that Professor Quirrell, who teaches Defense Against the Dark Arts, um, engages in some rather odd behavior, and they're not really sure what his deal is. Um, until one night they go into the Forbidden Forest and they find a dead unicorn, which of course is shocking and terrifying because it's like one of the worst things that you can do. And all of this leads to, um, you know, all of these things that they experience and learn, etc., lead to the climactic moment. Now this is really important, okay, because a lot of people get confused as to what the climax is. The climax is the most suspenseful part of the plot, the turning point for the protagonist's character. And it is arguable that there are many climactic moments within a, a story. Um, I like to think of the climax as not just the turning point, but the point of no return. So like literally there's no going back. It's either um, a situation that the protagonist finds himself in or a choice that the protagonist makes. But basically once that happens, the whole trajectory of the story has changed and there is no reversing it, okay? So in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, one might claim that the point where Harry and his friends descend through the trap door um, to find the Sorcerer's Stone is that moment, okay? Um, they have lulled Fluffy to sleep. Fluffy's that three-headed dog. You see in that picture there. Um, they have made a choice that they cannot reverse. They're in it to win it, okay? Um, the next section of the pyramid talks about falling action. And it sounds like that that would be rather anticlimactic, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's three, it says three events or less that unravel the conflict between the protagonist and antagonist that lead to the resolution. Um, I don't know why it signifies that specific number of three, because again, in a, in a novel with a more complicated plot, there can be more than three. It's not a magic number. So when we look at the falling action that happens um, in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone that unravels the conflict, you have... Um, the different challenge, and to me, it's the different challenges once they've gone through the trapdoor uh, that Harry and his friends have to face to retrieve the Sorcerer's Stone. So you have the Devil's Snare that they have to escape, um, the winged keys, they have to find out which key opens the door to the next room. You have that life size chess game, um, and the potions riddle at the end where they have to drink the right potion in order to um, achieve the, the final goal. And of course, with the help of his friends, Harry is able to do all of those things. And we get to the point where uh, we have the resolution. So the resolution um, is where the conflict is resolved and we discover whether the protagonist achieved their goal or not. I would like to argue that the resolution is not always resolved. Okay, sometimes you just kind of have to um, come to terms with the fact that there is no answer. Uh, a lot of us get really frustrated by novels that, that deal with that, but um, but in this case, in Harry Potter, there is resolution to the conflict of this particular story. Um, spoiler alert, okay, in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry completes all of the tasks with his friend's help, and when he drinks that final potion, he's taken to a room with Professor Quirrell, da, 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 where he realizes that Quirrell is not the man Harry thought he was, um, he is not a meek, stuttering little professor. How, um, he is a servant of Voldemort. Dun, dun, dun. And, um, and under his turban, he is a disturbing little baby Voldemort growing out of the back of his head. So anyway, um, we do solve the mystery of who's trying to steal the Sorcerer's Stone. Um, and ultimately... 
Harry and the Sorcerer's Stone are both saved by Dumbledore, and the conflict is resolved. Um, so that's the resolution. The next step is the denouement. And honestly, resolution and denouement are often um, kind of lumped together or confused. But the resolution is, is the um, resolving of the conflict, whereas the denouement is just kind of like cleaning up the messy stuff after, tying up the loose ends. So in the last chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, after Harry's rescued by Dumbledore, um, there's a whole explanation of, you know, what happened with Quirrell and how he became Voldemort's servant and, you know, uh, why he wanted the potion and, um, or I mean, I'm sorry, the stone. So Dumbledore explains to Harry and all of us as readers or viewers of the movie, everything that happened. So um, that's not really the resolution in and of itself. It's more like tying up the loose ends afterward, which is what the denouement is. Um, additionally, uh, the school year ends. So that's not really part of the bigger conflict in terms of Harry's ongoing battle with Voldemort, but um, it is part of the story of Harry continuing his education through Hogwarts. So we find out that thanks to the courage and skill of Harry and his friends, Gryffindor wins the House Cup. And of course, uh, the story continues on with book number two uh, and Harry's next year at school. So... Um, that is basically following through the plot of a story. And what's really interesting um, about that is, is that while all the details are different, every story follows the same pattern, okay? Um, the Freytag's Pyramid, um, the, the plot mapping in and of itself is a kind of archetype, if you will. And speaking of archetypes, um, it's noteworthy to mention that there are many character archetypes found in the Harry Potter novels, specifically the one I just explained. Um, if you're familiar with the story, um, you know, maybe you could try to identify them. If you're not, you know, among, even among these notes, right, you have the loyal retainers, which are Harry's friends, Ron and Hermione. You have the mentor or the sage, which is Dumbledore. You have the trickster, um, which is Snape. You're not really sure whose side he is on. Um, you have, of course, the enemy, which is Voldemort, and in this case, his stand-in, Professor Quirrell. So you have, uh, you know, again, just trying to teach you not even necessarily that the what book you read is important, but the fact that these ongoing patterns show us that there are um, universal ideas that we cling to as humans over a span of space and time um, that allow us to identify with these characters and their journeys. So um, that is my message to you about plot mapping. And now, of course, your assignment is going to be to plot map um, your own novel that you read now that you've finished it. And um, if you have any questions or concerns about that assignment, please feel free to email me throughout the week or you can um, join in with the Google Meet on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Have a great day, everyone.